So over to this evening's talk. Uh, we are delighted uh, this evening uh, to welcome Dr. Ian Hendy from the University of Portsmouth. And his talk this evening is called The Coastal Blue Green, Why Are Seagrass and Kelp Forests So Important? Now, I first met Ian uh, at an Earth Environment Intelligence event at the Eden Project. And I have to say, I uh, was witness to two of the most inspiring and engaging presentations I have ever seen. Uh, and tonight, he's gonna to present one of those uh, to us. His way with an audience is fantastic. Uh, and I have no doubt that he is gonna be looking forward uh, to your questions about seagrass, kelp forest regeneration and monitoring. And of course, some of you may have seen Ian's work being featured on last Sunday's uh, BBC Country File programme, because there was a, a number of sections uh, about the development of seagrass areas and the importance of them when it comes to climate change mitigation. So Ian, welcome this evening. We're delighted to have you with us. It's over to you. Wow, Roger, thank you very much for that blistering and wonderful introduction. Much appreciated. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, delighted to see you all here. So as Roger and David have already said, my name's Ian Hendy. And um, in fact, I'm a tropical marine ecologist. So I study ecosystems such as mangrove forests, seagrass beds, coral reefs, and they can range from anywhere from Indonesia, spanning all the way over to the Caribbean. Also in the UK, I study cold water ecosystems. So these can be from salt marsh, seagrass habitats, kelp forests, and also oyster reefs. So today, as already mentioned by Roger, I'm gonna be talking about seagrass, and I'm also gonna be talking about the restoration of kelp forests. So what I'm gonna be doing is sharing a screen so bear with me i uh, hopefully you guys can all see this if i can just get a thumbs up in a minute there we go fantastic so the coastal blue green so the green being sea grasses of course and the blue being uh, the ocean and of course we'll be talking about kelp forest so why are these ecosystems so vitally important not only for the biodiversity of our coastal ecosystems but also for the longevity of our climate, our biodiversity and our livelihoods and the people that are dependent upon them. So by means of uh, an overview, I'm going to be speaking about kelp ecology. Then I'm going to be talking about the impacts to kelp forests. Then we're going to be talking about a project that I'm heavily involved with called the Help Our Kelp Project or the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. This in actual fact is UK's largest kelp restoration project. So we'll be talking about that. I'm also gonna be talking about UNESCO biospheres. So I help monitor and run these amazing reserves. So they span from the land to marine environments. And I'm gonna be talking about what we do with those ecosystems. And in actual fact, we have a marine biosphere that encompasses the Isle of Wight on the South Coast. And I'm heavily involved in the management of that marine protected area. And I'm also, of course, going to talk about seagrasses and why they're important. So what I want to do first and foremost is give a little bit of context to this narrative of why we need salt marshes, why we need seagrasses, all these wonderful coastal ecosystems and why they're so important. So let's give a little bit of narrative of why we need to restore these ecosystems. So if you think of the planet, Think of the planet as a whole, 30% of it is land, okay? Now, with increasing human populations, in about 30 years from now, we're gonna have about 10 billion people on the planet. And at currently, we're at about eight, okay? Or just under eight. So we're gonna have another two billion people or so coming onto the planet, okay? So there's a lot more resources being utilized there's a lot more of natural habitats being used up, okay? So at the minute, there's an increased demand on what we call ecosystem services. Now, these services can be what food provisioning, it could be from 
habitat. It could be for protection of ecosystems, storm protection. All of these ecosystem services will have a huge value. Now, at the minute, of course, with increasing human demand upon those systems, we're utilizing those ecosystem services. And in fact, in the last 50 years, we've lost 50% of those services. So if we carry on at the same rate of loss, by the end of the century, we will have little or no ecosystem services left or little value to these really important ecosystems. So therefore, looking at the land is really going to be unlikely for restoration to mitigate things like habitat loss and climate change. Now, what we need to do, of course, is focus on the ocean. 70% of our planet is water. Okay? So we, there's, a, there's a greater probability to restore carbon-rich ecosystems. That then can draw down those atmospheric gases and mitigate those impacts from climate change. So what we need to do then, guys, is become really a carbon-absorbing society rather than a carbon-emitting society. So I'm going to talk about those impacts later on, further on in this talk. But at the minute, in terms of exploitation of our ecosystem services, we're at 1.8 planets worth of resources. So we're almost two planets now in terms of the exploitation of our natural resources. So if you think about it, we need to be really resourceful in how we adapt to future populations and increasing populations and how we react to things like climate change, habitat loss, loss of these important ecosystem services and what that means for future generations, of course. So we've got to be more sustainable. So let's think about kelp forests and why kelp are very important. So kelp are what we call a brown algae. So they're macro, macro species of alga. So they're very, very large. And in the UK, we have 50% of all European species. So the UK, in actual fact, is very well suited for having kelp forests. So we're going to talk about why that is in a minute. Now, of course, they form these beautiful underwater forests. Now, they purify the water. They create what we call a nursery function. So you see lots of juvenile fish species living around these forests, these underwater forests. So they are amazing ecosystems to be in, in actual fact. They grow in rocky areas only. Now, this is really important in actual fact in terms of the ecology of these ecosystems. So I'm going to talk about that later on as well, why that's important. For example, with the seagrass habitat, these will grow in a soft sediment, muddy environment. Now, the dynamics of that will actual fact the change the carbon cycle in relation to the amount of carbon those ecosystems can sequester. But we'll talk about that in a bit. They grow in shallow oceans, of course, because these organisms photosynthesize so that you need really good UV light intensity going into the water. So good water quality and, and penetration of that light intensity for the absorbency of the UV light. They're what we call ecosystem engineers. So really, this is just a posh word for an organism that mitigates climate change. It reduces greenhouse gases, and it creates habitat for a range of organisms, particularly commercially important organisms as well. So it's a very important organism to have or ecosystem to have in the coastal environment. Now, common species will have along the south coast of the UK and spanning around the small peninsula of the southwest, all going along Cornwall there, will have many different species, but three in particular. So we have a species called tangleweed or Laminaria hyperborea. Now this species is found to a depth of about 10 meters. And as you can see here, it's subtidal, very clear water. And what this is doing in actual fact is providing habitat for a whole range of fish species. So for the productivity, for example, to give really good context in and around Cornwall with the rich vibrant marine life that we have around there, a lot of that is being driven by these kelp species. We also have Laminaria digitata. Now this is, it looks similar in actual fact to Laminaria hyperborea, but what it has are these different fronds and it has more numerous fronds along its top here. Now these fronds will reach the canopy of the water, absorbing all of that UV light where they can grow. Now Laminaria digitata will grow in shallower water and it will fringe Laminaria hyperborea. So you see this zonation pattern 
of the kelp forest. And then also we have Saccharina latissima, otherwise known as sugar kelp. Now, this species completely different to how it looks to Laminaria digitata and Laminaria hyperborea. It doesn't have those finger-like fronds. It has these wide fronds. Now this species in actual fact is opportunistic in its range. It can go down to 10 meters, but it also can go to what we put subtidally or intertidally as well. So it can go to very shallow areas. And it can also grow in murkier water systems as well. This is because it's got a larger frond, it's got a wider surface area, so it could absorb more UV light. Now thinking about kelp ecology and why it's important. So if you think about increasing greenhouse gases, creating climate change, warming our climate, warming the oceans, melting polar ice caps. Now, what we need to do is absorb that CO2 from the atmosphere, and pull it down and lock it away from the atmosphere. Now, kelp in actual fact is a really effective carbon sponge. So it draws down CO2 from the atmosphere 20 to 30 times faster than terrestrial plants. So it's a really good effective carbon sponge. It absorbs aqueous CO2 in the oceans. So this is really important. Um, for the uninitiated, what happens is if you have an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, you get an increase in the dissolution of CO2 in water, creating extra hydrogen ions. This creates ocean acidification. So basically what happens is with kelp in the water, it absorbs the increase of CO2 into its tissues Therefore, it increases the level of pH, which means it reduces the acidification. So it actually reduces localized acidification up to many kilometers in actual fact from the shoreline. So this is really important. It oxygenates the water. So through photosynthesis, it creates a healthier water uh, environment for fish species, particularly the juveniles. So we see juvenile cuttlefish, we see bass, we see cod, or developing in these nursery habitats. So it's very important you have a healthy environment. So the greater the amount of nutrients there are in the water, the healthier the fish species there are. So the greater the fish stocks. And of course, ultimately, that's a positive feedback loop linking to the communities that are dependent upon those ecosystems. Kelp will reduce wave energy by up to 70% in terms of their storm surges. So with increasing climate change, we see increasing storms this is really important. So for councils, governments and government agencies that want to spend millions of pounds mitigating the storms for storm defences, having what we call nature based solutions will reduce those impacts and those costs. Because if you have salt marsh, seagrass and kelp forest, the magic three UK ecosystems, you can dampen down those storm waves and you can also significantly increase carbon stocks and reduce climate change. They reduce coastal erosion. If you're reducing stormways and stormway buffering on the coasts, you're reducing the runoff from those fine sediments. So you reduce ocean civic, uh, you reduce coastal erosion and ocean acidification and those storm surges from all of these benefits. And of course, food provisioning. Now this is really important because it creates habitat. And that habitat creates what we call a nursery function. As I've already intimated, the structure of the kelp, as you can see here in this image here, if I draw down to this image to the right, the structure of the kelp provides safety for juvenile and vulnerable species, particularly for the complexity provided by these underwater forests, it offers protection because the greater the complexity of the ecosystem, the greater the reduction of predator-prey interactions. Kelp will act as what we call a carbon conveyor. Okay, so if you think back to about five minutes ago, I talked about that kelp will grow on a rocky substrata. Now, this is really important because a seagrass habitat will grow in a soft sediment environment. Okay, now what it will do with seagrass is they'll draw down the CO2 from the atmosphere. And as the carbon is absorbed into the tissues of the seagrass, it's taken below ground into the mud where it's stored for many hundreds of years. Now, kelp do not do this. Okay, so what kelp will do is yes, they draw it down very effectively, 
20 to 30 times faster than terrestrial plants. But what kelp will do is store it within the actual fleshy tissues, but those fleshy tissues will then break off and get transported down to deeper ocean trenches where that kelp carbon store will remain for a millennia, in actual fact, in deeper ocean trenches. And in actual fact, we just started a PhD project with some students in Sussex and Brighton looking at the fate of kelp derived carbon. So we're looking into this as we speak. Kelp, in actual fact, or kelp forests will contribute to almost 50% of the primary production of adjacent UK coastal fisheries. So what do we mean by primary production? So the actual growth rate of kelp in its tissue, so the fronds, which are the leaf-like structures, 50% of that will feed coastal fisheries. So in other words, all of the fisheries and the rich, vibrant biodiversity that we see around our UK coasts, 50% of those are dependent upon our kelp forests. So they're super, super crucial to the biodiversity for our fisheries. 80% of that kelp carbon, so 80% of the fronds of those tissues that you see in the kelp. So if I see, if I show you this image here, with my virtual laser pointer, all of these things here are called the fronds. These are the leaf-like structures. And you see this stipe here. This reaches to the canopy on the ocean surface all the way down to the seabed where it anchors itself to the rocks. Now, these tissues here, 80% of them will enter the detrital food chain, okay? So it goes through the food chain. So those fisheries are dependent upon those kelp tissues, that kelp energy. So this is what we call connectivity, which is super important. So not only do you have the structure of the ecosystem, which are these kelp fronds themselves, but you also have the function. Now that function is the energy flow between the food webs of the primary consumers, going all the way through to the apex predators, that energy feeding through the ecosystem. So it's super vital and super important. 85% of those storm waves are reduced in a distance of 250 meters. So it's really important, okay, that we have kelp forests to dampen down increasing hurricanes and increasing storms. Again, looping back to coastal erosion and storm defenses. So let's think about the impacts to kelp. And there are many. Now, guys, I really don't want to instill ecological grief because we are turning the tide on this, okay? So there's big pushes now for conservation, big pushes for restoration around the world. And this could be for mangrove forests, this could be for kelp forests, this could be for, for coral reefs. So you name it, there's big restoration projects globally on many different ecosystems. So for the impacts that we're seeing on kelp, for example, um, global warming, okay? So warming oceans, kelp are very sensitive to increasing sea temperatures. And so we're seeing shifts in patterns of kelp species in their distribution. Habitat destruction, coastal development. Now, of course, with the onset of loss of habitat, habitat fragmentation, increases in marinas around the world, all of these things are removing the key habitat for kelp, okay? Destructive activities things like mobile fishing, so trawling. Now, I will say this, I'm not against commercial fishing at all. What I'm against is the destructive aspect of commercial fishing. And we can talk about that and some of the aspects of that. There's natural fact a really good project in Dorset and Devon called the Lime Bay Fishery. Now, they, those fishermen there, in actual fact, have created a co-op where they're where facilitating low impact sustainable fishing where they're using static fishing gears only. Now, effectively, if you're trawling or if you're dredging or dragging a net over the seabed, you're effectively got a giant lawnmower and you're mowing the kelp forest down, of course. So it's that destructive activity that's damaging those ecosystems. And as I said, coastal development. Now, all of these things lead to what we call a phase shift. What does a phase shift mean? This is where the ecosystem goes from a steady state to an unstable state, okay? Now, principally for a kelp forest, what's happening is if you're dredging, if you're mining the seabed where the kelp forest will live, you're breaking up that hard rocky substrata. And what you're doing is creating this veneer, 
this out uh, this shingle veneer where the kelp sporophytes so the baby kelp won't be able to settle on this soft shifting veneer okay so it's very dynamic ecosystem it needs a very stable environment so it's created this phase shift now we've all seen these graphs before guys so along the x-axis here we have time and on the y-axis we have global mean temperature and we also have co2 concentrations or these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and currently at the minute present day we're at about 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, what we have each year are government agencies, climate change scientists will get together in a conference called the International Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC. They get together to talk about the impacts and how they can mitigate climate change. OK, now what we see, of course, the first one we had was in 1990, then there was another climate change conference many years later and so on another one later on still but what do you all see with the current trend in actual fact co2 is steadily increasing so what we're doing and this is typical to human nature we're not learning from our mistakes until it's too late of course but as i say i don't want to instill ecological grief because the tide is turning governments have called a, a, a climate crisis you see on the TV now with actual adverts about seagrass, for example, with multinationals wanting to offset their carbon budgets to, to pay for these really important ecosystems for the restoration of those habitats. So things are looking bright and it's a step forward in actual fact in the right direction. So kelp impacts, and as I said, let's think about this in a little more detail. Um, so you see these heat maps here in and around different regions globally. Now, off the east coast of Canada, 90% of the kelp forests have disappeared in 40 years. 90% of kelp have disappeared on the east coast of Canada. Extensive kelp forests there that have now gone. 80% of kelp forests around Norway have gone in the last 20 years. And this is of course through uh, uh, coastal sea defenses, uh, coastal development and coastal change loss of kelp has been significant in those habitats. Now in the UK, everyone, if we carry on at the same rate of loss of kelp, if we continue to lose kelp at the same rate of loss that we're doing around our UK coastal waters, by the end of the century, we will have zero kelp, kelp forest left. So no kelp forest. Now don't forget, think back to five minutes ago when I talked about the, pro the productivity of kelp. So 50% of kelp production benefiting all of those coastal ecosystems in and around our fisheries in UK waters. 80% of kelp production directly feeding coastal fisheries. So they're super important. So that means if you lose kelp and you lose its structure, you lose its nursery function. So with a loss of kelp comes an associated loss of biodiversity of up to 90% of associated biodiversity. And so if we were to think about this and say, well, OK, let's work with the stakeholders to bring back the kelp forests. Let's work with the fishermen that are directly dependent upon their fisheries for survival. What we can do is if we employ low impact, sustainable models that can be worked with, essentially what you're doing is you're mitigating climate change and you're improving the fisheries and you're improving the local economy for these people. So it's a win for the environment, it's a win for the economy and it's a win for people that are directly dependent upon them. So it's super important, of course. So this is where it brings on to now uh, the Help Our Kelp project or the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. Now, this is an actual, a huge initiative that I'm very fortunate and lucky enough to be involved with um, in actual fact, this spans from Brighton all the way to Chichester on the south coast where I live. So 30 mile stretch of coastline covering the areas covering 300 square kilometres, vast area. So this is the largest kelp restoration project in the UK. Now, this is the area where I live. So this is Portsmouth here. So I'm speaking to you about here. And this is the area where we want to restore. Back in the 1980s, 
um, the kelp forests were very dense in actual fact, they were huge. Uh, I remember in actual fact, back in the mid eighties, uh, shock horror, uh, I used to be a commercial fisherman. Um, I was the world's worst commercial fisherman, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I realized I was into uh, conservation back then because every time we would catch lobsters, um, the guy that I worked for would say to me, right Ian, do you want a full wage packet at the end of the week or do you want to take half wages and half your money in lobsters. I would always take half my money in lobsters and I would cycle straight back round to the seafront and let the lobsters go again. Absolutely true, that's what I would do. And my mum thought it was really sweet that I would do this. And uh, back then uh, I didn't realise that I was heavily into conservation even though I was already doing it. So I was the world's worst fisherman. Um, but I remember the kelp forest and present day, this is what we have now. We've in actual fact lost 96% of our kelp forests in and around Sussex. So this is what we have now. And this is what we used to have back in the 80s, 40 years ago. And so what we're tasked with is bringing back these kelp forests back to their former glory. Now, this is the actual area of 300 square kilometers that we want to protect. Now, what we've actually done, uh, and this was an actual fact, this project has already been running four years, by the way. Um, the first three and a half years were spent dealing with litigation and dealing with the legalities of working with the government and DEFRA. Okay, this is really important. So what we had to do was set up working groups with stakeholders, with the fishermen, with government agencies and with councils. So this was a lot of red tape and bear in mind, I'm an applied ecologist, okay? So I like getting in, the, getting in the water, getting my hands dirty. So all of this kind of red tape, boring stuff has to be done first. But if you don't do that, you don't have a restoration project and you don't have a conservation project. So what we did was formulate these working groups with the fishermen, formulate the working groups with the councils and with the governments. And we were lucky enough to make a film um, a documentary, a very short documentary, explaining the benefits of kelp forests. Um, we got David Attenborough to narrate this documentary. It went out on the BBC. In actual fact, it went viral. It went crazy. Um, and this then generated the hearts of the general public. Everybody then realised why kelp is important. This film was very emotive. And so what we did was create this petition. We got over 100,000 signees to sign this petition, then what we had was the first government sanctioned NPA or marine protected area. So this is the first for the UK. So we're hoping now that this can be rolled out around the UK using this same model. Now, within this 300 square kilometers, we're going to be restoring the natural habitat of where the kelp used to be, which was in around this area, which covered about 170 square kilometers. So the actual 300 square kilometers will act as a bit of a buffer zone to protect those kelp species. So what we're gonna be doing is creating vital nursery habitats. Okay, so the nursery function, providing crucial habitat for commercial fisheries. Very important in actual fact for what we call ecosystem robustness and ecosystem resilience. This is super important. If you remember, I talked about ecosystem services. Now, we had uh, an ecological um, economist value, value the 170 square kilometers of kelp. Now, per year, this is per year, the value in money for the local communities of these kelp forests is over three million pounds a year. Now, if you think about that, that staggering amount of money that's going back into the local community because they got the seaweed basically on their coastline. So it's super important. Of course, the fishermen will benefit because their commercial fisheries will come back and become thrive again, breathing new life literally back into those coasts. You're mitigating climate change and you're boosting the local economy. So the Help Our Kelp Project or the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. So as I say, we're a consortia um, of, of many different organisations, okay, the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. We've got Sir David Attenborough to rate this wonderful documentary. There is the link. Um, 
what I'll probably do is is actually that you, you'll be able to see this link because it's being recorded so you can watch that if you want to guys we work with uh, local fishing authorities the Sussex IFCA big wave productions that made the documentary uh, Sussex Wildlife Trust Sussex University Brighton University the university I work with Portsmouth University Zoological Society of London Nature Metrics that create what we call eDNA environmental DNA very important for looking at baseline surveys of the biodiversity. This is really important because as you're seeing the uplift of kelp, rock, kelp forest regenerating, of course, we want to have some metrics to measure against. And one of those metrics, of course, is going to be biodiversity. So looking at the DNA of those species as they're returning back from year one, year two, year three, and so on and so forth, you can measure that uplift. We also work with the Blue Marine Foundation and the Marine Conservation Society as well. So as I've already said, uh, we're restoring over 300 square kilometers, but within that, we're gonna bring back almost 170 square kilometers of kelp. Now, of course, this is gonna bring back the ecology of the environment, okay? It's gonna bring back the biodiversity and the fisheries. It's gonna help the environment and of course, help local communities with the local economy. So it's super important that we bring back these ecosystems. So as I say, I don't wanna instill ecological grief, because there's many projects like this around the world and these huge initiatives to restore kelp forests. And what we want to do is do this naturally. And so we want to protect the seabed from destructive activity and let the kelp grow back naturally. Now, I'm tasked with my specific job with the kelp project is tasked with looking at the barriers of why kelp isn't going to grow back. So if you remember, I talked about phase shifts. So I'm gonna be doing what we call mesocosm studies at the Institute of Marine Sciences, looking at why in certain areas, kelp isn't growing. It could be the fact that there's no substrate for the kelp to settle on. It could be the fact that the water is too warm for kelp to regrow back in. It could be the fact that water quality is not right. Or it could be the fact that the water is what we call too turbid. There's too much sedimentation in the water and the UV light cannot penetrate through so the kelp cannot photosynthesize. So there's a lot of projects ongoing that I'm going to be looking into, along with my other colleagues looking at the biodiversity, looking at what we call biodiversity uplift, and also looking at the kelp carbon or the fate of kelp derived carbon. So there was a snapshot there into kelp forest and what we're doing and the positives of what we're doing. Like what I want to do now, guys, is then shift a little bit onto talking about seagrasses and why seagrass is important. Now, a lot of my research, in actual fact, is looking at seagrass restoration and seagrass protection in the Yucatan Peninsula in the Caribbean, in Mexico. Um, I did a really good study a few years ago, which we just published in actual fact last year, looking at the impacts of sargassum to seagrass beds. But what I'm gonna be doing is talking about the benefits of uh, UNESCO biospheres and how that ties in locally on the South Coast to the protection of seagrasses. So let's think about this in layers first and foremost, everyone. So what is a marine biosphere or a, a, a UNESCO biosphere? So these are nominated by national governments. So they're super important much like the kelp forest in Sussex. So this is uh, a government sanctioned protected area, but UNESCO biospheres in actual fact span from the land going out to the sea. And they're in actual fact, um, incorporate the needs, the cultural needs of humans that are dependent upon those ecosystems. So if you're in developing countries, if you're in developed countries, they're sensitive to the needs of the people that are dependent upon those habitats. So they're very important in actual fact. And of course, they're very good things for sustainable development. So United Nations um, created an initiative called SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals, really important. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals state that by the year 2030, 30% of our ecosystems or our ecosystem services need to be fully protected okay so that means no extractive activity occurring at all so we need to get to achieve to those goals by another 10 years well less than 10 years in actual fact 
we're, we're working towards doing that. So they actually are in line with sustainable development goals. Um, they provide solutions, local solutions to global challenges, climate change, for example. So they're very good at protecting key carbon rich ecosystems. They're very good at protecting the biodiversity. So that's the function of the ecosystem. So if you provide protection for the structure and the function, you're giving that ecosystem longevity. So people, if they're utilizing or exploiting that ecosystem in a sustainable way, um, you've got longevity from generation to generation to utilize those ecosystems. And of course, as I already said, they incorporate terrestrial and marine and coastal environments, okay? And they mitigate impacts against losses of biodiversity. They reduce impacts from climate change. And of course, they're very good solutions for conservation and sustainability, which links directly back into sustainable development goals or SDGs, which have been implemented by governments globally to actually incorporate a healthier future for, for everyone in actual fact. So seagrass beds, um, and again, here we go, talking about the ecological impacts and the destruction. 50% of seagrasses have disappeared in and around, particularly in our local waters in actual fact around the UK. So we're losing these ecosystems. And again, much like kelp forests, we're losing those habitats through coastal development and coastal change. Now these ecosystems, very sensitive to their habitat that they live. And if you're changing the seabed habitat through coastal dredging, for example, you're changing the tidal elevation, you get a reduction in those ecosystems. This is what we call coastal squeeze. You're changing the environment where seagrass can live. And in actual fact, seagrass is, is eroding at a rate of about 40 hectares per year in the UK. So really big problem in actual fact, the rate of loss. So it's quite worrying in actual fact. Um, seagrasses um, are very unique, um, much like a mangrove forest or salt marsh, that they can grow and tolerate salt water. If you were to water a terrestrial plant with salt water, it would die pretty much instantly. But these plants are able to thrive in salt water. And again, there's that word, they're ecosystem engineers. They provide habitat, they provide structure for juvenile and vulnerable organisms. They draw down atmospheric greenhouse gases. They store carbon in their sediments. They're very important in actual fact for their structure driving biodiversity. So they create and enhance an active food web. So they provide and generate a really wide array of organisms dependent upon uh, those ecosystems. And in actual fact, if you combine mangroves, sea grasses, salt marsh and kelp forests, 80%, 80, 80 of all marine life are either directly or indirectly dependent upon those ecosystems. So that's how vital and important and crucial these ecosystems are. They create a very important carbon sink. Now this is their top end amount of carbon that they can store. Now this, these, these carbon sinks will probably been taken in and around the Mediterranean where we see big thick seagrass beds. And they can store anywhere up to about 100 to 140 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Locally in and around the UK, it is much less, but the top end, they can store quite significant amounts of carbon. And a hectare is about the size of a football pitch. So it's a lot of carbon that these, these ecosystems can store. They store carbon about 35 times faster than rainforests in actual fact. So again, super productive and super important in their sequestration of carbon into the sediment. So this is vital in actual fact. And of course, I've already said, much like kelp forests, they provide a direct link to coastal biodiversity, driving those coastal fisheries and driving that flow of energy, not only within the ecosystem, but between ecosystems. So why are they important again? So habitat forming species. So the structure providing the function of the biodiversity for these key ecosystems, which are very important for the stakeholders dependent upon them. Like uh, uh, um, kelp forests, they reduce coastal erosion. So they're very good storm defences. So usually in the UK, what we have in the high intertidal assault marsh 
then subtitly you'll have the seagrass ecosystems then beyond the seagrass further deeper still you'll have the kelp forest so you have if you have all three of those ecosystems you have a great ecosystem resiliency creating what we call nature-based solutions so you'll have reduced storm defenses uh, reduced storm waves and you have reduced coastal erosion with increased natural storm defenses they reduce coastal erosion of course uh, through their activity of their root systems they create these rhizomes within the sediments this reduces the impact of loss of deposition of those sediments so it stabilizes them and of course along with kelp forests they can reduce storm waves in actual fact by between 25 to 50 percent so super important and again as i've already said their structure and their function provide this wide and rich biodiverse ecosystem of biodiversity and of course through their nursery function it's very important because they have a huge value for commercial fisheries now what we're doing here is providing protection in and around the isle of wight so this is directly on the south coast so here we have portsmouth here where i live and work and this is the isle of wight just off the coast here we have the solent here and what we're doing is implementing a phd in actual fact phd student to run the infrastructure of this unesco biosphere in and around the isle of wight so this will have a range of different ecosystems ranging from salt marsh to seagrass beds and we have extensive seagrass beds in actual fact spanning all the way around ride and all the way around this area here too um, we also got a very uh, important exciting thresher shark project going on as well but that's another story but all around here we're protecting these coastal carbon rich ecosystems to mitigate climate change to improve local fisheries. And the management of this with our PhD student here is gonna be looking at the restoration of these key ecosystems and mapping them as well. So we need to determine the, the, the volume of the aerial extent of these ecosystems of salt marsh, seagrass and kelp. We can then calculate the carbon stores in that. And particularly in actual fact, it lends very well to looking at carbon stores in and around ride. Um, which I can talk about later, but it's quite, it's quite an onerous task trying to determine the sources of carbon, particularly if you want to get um, carbon credits and biodiversity credits. That's a really important issue and quite contentious at the minute in actual fact. And I'm working with uh, carbon accreditation companies to actually look at how you can uh, um, effectively and accurately determine carbon stores, particularly in seagrass beds, uh, we're doing this in kelp forest actively now and we're also doing it in mangrove forest and we're actually successful in mangrove forest quite recently in fact so the overall aim then for our um, unesco biosphere is to protect the existing sea grasses is to enhance the carbon sinks of those sea grasses in and around the isle of wight so improve the carbon stocks which will increase its value of course enhance the energy flow of the biodiversity with the animals that are dependent upon it and also we're linking this as well to the kelp project that we've got going which spans from chichester which is very close to the isle of wight all the way to uh, brighton and this will hatch or fact will mitigate climate change locally and we want to roll this out all the way around the UK. And of course, it will enhance, significantly enhance biodiversity as well and the local economy. And of course, will improve the community engagement because where it's a biosphere, a UNESCO biosphere, it's for, um, it's basically for people dependent upon those ecosystems for the cultural needs of those people so they can be actively involved in this project. So it's super important, super exciting. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm not sure how long I was talking for there, but I think I've, I went over there. Are there any questions, please? Well, <laughs> thank you, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're, we'll, that was fantastic. I did, I did tell our audience this evening that you are an absolute dynamo. And I must admit, it has brought back memories. I did an undergraduate degree in marine biology. And I have just been scribbling away here. I love your lobster story. You can all, always spot a conservationist very, very early on. But yeah, let's go over to the questions. And I know we've got one, uh, one coming in. Uh, oh no, it's a comment. It's a lovely comment from Lily, uh, who's doing anthropological research at 
I think that she just says thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, I've learned a lot, so, so thank you for that, uh, Ian. Um, one thing whilst people are thinking of questions, it was interesting that you said in the UK our seagrass is eroding at 40 hectares per year. Uh, I just put that into perspective for those that are with us this evening. In Cornwall, according to the State of Nature Cornwall report in 2020, we have, uh, we have 120 hectares of intertidal mud in Cornwall. So you imagine if that was all full of seagrass, we'd lose that in three years at that particular rate. I mean, that is, that is frightening. But here we go, we've got a question coming in uh, from, from David. David, do you want to ask your question direct? <laughs> I can do, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, Ian, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I was curious, um, when you talked about the kelp restoration project, you mentioned that you're protecting the habitat and letting it regrow naturally, um, rather than, I'm assuming you can plant it somehow or seed it. So I was wondering, because there's been so much habitat loss, why are you just doing that? And is it not better to actively plant loads? That's a, gr a great question, David. So um, the best uh, restoration you could use, of course, is Mother Nature. You know, it does it best. And so essentially what we're doing is we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna leave Mother Nature to do its thing for the next year or two, okay, and see where the gaps are. Now, this is vitally important because what we don't want to do is start interfering with the natural succession of the kelp regrowth. And what we do know, David, is that, that kelp is going to grow back in many areas, not all areas. We know it's going to grow back in many areas. And already we've instructed um, specialist labs, particularly in Scotland, that are creating what we call a kelp alginate. So what we've done with many students and many undergrad students already last year, we've collected uh, kelp sporophytes. So basically baby kelp. And we've collected them locally in and around Sussex waters. And we sent them over to this lab in Scotland and they created this alginate rich, sporophyte rich glue. It's a bit like a jelly and you can freeze it. So what we're doing essentially is trialing this gel and we're gonna put non-permanent structures down in areas where kelp isn't regrowing. So things like stones, things like ropes, we're going to put this alginate on those and we're going to see the growth rate of the kelp regrowing back. Now, what my job is, is when I'm at Portsmouth, I'm going to be using Aquaria to replicate the habitat that we have in Sussex. So poor water quality, increased water temperature, lack of substrate. And I'm going to be testing those barriers against kelp restoration and natural regeneration. So this will give us a greater understanding of how we can get through and over those hurdles when it comes to the active restoration part. So it's all about, I guess, doing our due diligence before uh, um, the restoration occurs. So we're kind of ticking those boxes and answering those questions. So when basically when it comes to doing the active restoration part, we can hit the ground running and we know exactly what we can do in this site as opposed to this site as opposed to this site because each site is going to be different for example basically so so the in short the answer is we'll be doing both so we're letting mother nature do its course and then after a while once we identify where the gaps are um, then we're going to be start uh, looking into how we can restore that in an active process great thank you okay th thank you david two comments coming in uh chris chris moore uh, saying thank you Ian that was very interesting and Bliss has said thank you this was absolutely incredible and mind-blowing so that's that's good to know. Um, Lily do you want to ask your question direct to Ian or would you like me to ask it? There you go Lily hello um, welcome. Hello. Thank you for the presentation it was really interesting. Um, I think I had a question about the kelp seaweed industry in, in general and how it's growing now and the demand might be growing as well and if you think it can be done in a sustainable way and if you're hopeful or worried about it um so again great a great question lily um an actual fact um although i am an applied ecologist um 
I'm 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 also a realist, and have, you have to work with you have to work with governments, you have to work with businesses, and you have to work with these people and stakeholders. If you don't, you don't have these projects. So there's room for everyone, and I'm all for the commercialization of it. In actual fact, um, I work with companies in North Devon that uh, uh, create sustainable kelp farms. I actual fact, I've got an ongoing project in Namibia on the west coast of Africa where we're looking at kelp restoration utilizing a kelp farm. Now, kelp itself is really important. It's a superfood, so it's really good to eat. It acts as a really good natural compost. And what you can do in actual fact is harvest uh, um, the growth of kelp. So kelp will grow um, if you've got the right water quality in the UK, kelp will grow about half a meter to a meter every month okay so it grows quite rapidly so if you harvest that growable bit you can harvest that off and you can then monetize that bit so you're always drawing down carbon from the atmosphere and you're always harvesting it so it's a sustainable economy in actual fact so of course it's improving the biodiversity you're improving the water quality you're drawing down carbon but you're also sustainable with 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 superfood production for example um kelp in actual fact in, in on the west coast of America in California can grow up to a meter per day in some places macrocystis species is over there it's super productive so it's a very important uh, economy and so I'm all for it in terms of commercializing it thank, thank you, you Lily for your question that's lovely thank you I mean in in Cornwall we do have uh, we have uh, Cornish seaweed as well which is a company that is uh, very much it's just the other side of the Helford Passage and they, they're producing oh go on Ian you were going to no, say I was just going to say no, no no that's fantastic Roger and, and also um, there's companies now making um, making paper and plastic particularly plastic from the cellulose derived from kelp and you can actually eat that plastic it's edible but it acts it you touch it you would think it's plastic and it biodegrades um, in about two weeks. So rather than having a single use plastic bottles, single use plastic bags, and of course, with the atrocities that occurs that we now know of, it lasts for millennia in the oceans, uh, there's companies now making uh, plastic derived from, from kelp cellulose. Well, that is brilliant. No, that, is, that, is, that is brilliant. That's such an insight. Um, thank, thank you, Ian. And uh, I mean, that's good to know that. Um, and again, that that commercialization, that benefit to the local community, but also thinking about sustainable approaches, are absolutely vital. And and this is what I was saying to you about uh, the Cornish Seaweed Company. They're not they're not only thinking about the sustainable harvesting of key, uh, seaweed, including kelps, uh, and they become a very successful company but they're also thinking about their packaging and using the kelp cellulose to produce their packaging uh, as well. In fact, I've received an order uh, earlier today, which is, is making that very, very clear. Does anybody have any other questions? I, I have a few, but I'd rather see if anyone else has got, anybody wants to unmute or put a question into the chat. nothing coming in at the moment so I'll just fill in time there Ian. On, on the country file program which was on last Sunday evening and if anybody hasn't seen it it will be available on BBC iPlayer but on there I know your lab was featured but they showed two different ways of uh, basically embedding the seagrass seed the seeds one of which involved them, and I, I won't go into too much detail because you might want to talk about it, dropping them through plastic drain pipes on the side of a boat so they actually sink down. And the other was using almost a transect line and placing the, 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 the seagrass seeds, which are in biodegradable hessian bags, straight into the intertidal mud. Why are the two different approaches and is, is one potentially more effective than the other. But you might want to talk through the process first. No, absolutely, absolutely, Roger. So um, the two processes are from 
two different projects in actual fact. Um, so the project we're doing is, is more labor intensive and more expensive, which is hand planting those seagrass seeds. So what we're doing, as you saw in the country file footage last, last week, is that we've got these small hessian sacks and uh, we get a little bit of seagrass seed, we get a little bit of fertilizer, we wrap the sacks up a bit like a bag of sweets tied up at the top. Then the bit that's tied up at the top, we turn it upside down and bury that in the mud to act as an anchor. That secures it. Now, in our project, we think that anchoring it down and locking the seagrass, seagrass seeds in with the fertilizer, and with the food, gives it a much better chance. And so what we're doing is collaborating with this other project in actual fact to see which are the best methods which yield the greatest growth of seagrasses because um, there have been many projects, particularly in America and in the States, uh, where is it now? Um, uh, Chesapeake Bay, in actual fact, on the east coast of America. What they did essentially was the dumping method, was get these tubes, pull the seagrass seeds in off the gunnel of the boat, and as the boat's moving along, the seagrass seeds would just fall in. But what happened was a lot of those seagrass seeds would, would either get eaten um, or they would just get washed away in the tide. So uh, um, although that's more of a natural way of doing it and it's a lot less labor intensive and cheaper, we feel doing it the way we're doing uh, um, is, is it could be far more successful, but of course far more labor intensive. But so what we're doing is, is, is doing this compare and contrast between the two different methods to see which is more effective. Um, and then of course, if the less labor intensive method is more effective, fantastic, then we'll go with that, but then we'll, we'll soon see. But now as actual fact, springtime, the, the sprout should be coming up and we could be starting doing some surveys, monitoring those tea grasses and new shoots coming through. So you should be getting results fairly soon, you hope? Absolutely, yeah, we should be starting seeing, as, as, the, as the water's warming up, we should be starting to see things shooting up pretty quickly, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Um, David, back over to you. You've got a bit of, you've got a technical question. Uh, yeah, well, you mentioned eDNA earlier, extracellular DNA. I heard it, I previously heard about it in terms of a possible way to characterize oyster species in estuaries. So I was wondering, is this, what does eDNA involve? Do you extract all DNA you can find in a sample and then does that tell you about the whole biodiversity so all animals plants microorganisms are present oh, in, in environmental DNA again great question David it, it's fantastic um I, I we, we use it in, in for the cow project we use it for our UNESCO biosphere project and we've got I've got a shark project in and around the Sodom where we're looking at all the elasma branks all the shark species now what it does essentially is give you a really good broad uh, snapshot of what's in the environment okay so essentially what you do is take a water sample in different areas so it's not just one sample you want really good replication as we all know all good science it's all about replication so the more replication you get the more water samples you get the more robust your data is so we get water samples then we run the water sample through a small filter, bit of, bit of filter paper. So it collects all of the material on that filter paper. Then we send it off to a lab and they test the DNA of the water sample of what's gone through it. And so um, you can test for whatever you want to test for. So fish species, for example, you can test for sharks, you name it, you can test it if it's in the water. Now, it's a bit contentious because What's to say if the fish was in the environment or did the tide bring it in? Okay, so there's lots of those questions to answer. So, but what we're doing is, let's say we're at ground zero now, okay? So year one, year two, year three, year three, as the ecosystems are recovering and replenishing, we're gonna be doing eDNA sampling over time. Now, Hopefully what you're seeing is a different eDNA signature over time. And what we've done is take eDNA samples of reference sites. So already healthy kelp forests along the west coast, uh, closer to Devon and Dorset, 
So we've got kelp forests over there that we've monitored and taken eDNA samples there. So we know what a healthy reference site looks like in terms of the community structure of the fish species dependent upon those ecosystems. So what we're doing is then replicating that here in, along the south coast. And at the minute, let's say there's 50 different species in a healthy site. At the minute, we've got three or four or five species in our impoverished damaged site. So over time, what we're expecting is to see the same eDNA signature increase to that level as the kelp replenish. But also on top of that, we're gonna be doing what we call ground truthing. So we're gonna be going and diving to look, basically look under the water to see if the fish are, re are, are recruiting back and also using video footage as well to monitor that as well. So there's a whole range of different systems we're using, but essentially what the eDNA is doing is giving us a broad overview or a, br a broad snapshot of the environment and the ecosystem, if you will. Thanks, that's really cool. So it is more um, signatures of the animals that live there rather than also plants and algae? Well, it could be plants and algae. So, it, so uh, as, as long as they've got the DNA assay of the particular species, the lab's got the DNA assay of the, of, the particular, of the species that you want to look for, they can test for it. And so, for example, for the kelp carbon, and so this is a really hard project that we've got. We've got a, we just won funding for a PhD student to look at this. Now, as I said, kelp is a carbon conveyor. So it pulls down carbon very effectively, but it doesn't store it in situ within the ecosystem. It stores it elsewhere. And so what we're doing is actually mapping the fate of kelp derived carbon. So we're looking at the kelp tissue. So we're looking at the carbon kelp tissues and we're looking at what we call stable isotope analysis. OK, so carbon 14. Um, we're looking at nitrogen as well. So we're looking at the different ratios of carbon and nitrogen within kelp uh, in the isotope versions. And we're tracing that through the ecosystem. OK, and so you can map that in the deep ocean trenches. OK, so you can actually determine kelp derived material in the deep ocean trenches. We're also going to be mapping it with eDNA as well. So you can actually identify it with that kelp signature. And so once we know where the kelp sources are, we can then quantify the volume of that carbon and then we can actually estimate those kelp carbon stores. Cool, thanks. I love how you answered my, I had another different technical question was about how you track the carbon sources and sinks. You <laughs> answered that within this one too, so perfect. <laughs> Cheers. No, that, that's wonderful, thank you. Does anybody, uh, it's gone very quiet uh, on the chat. I'm also aware we are coming up to 20 to 9 and uh, Ian you you probably had a long enough day already and got one uh, uh, coming uh, ahead of you tomorrow. Um, just one one question from me because really I know that seagrass and kelp forest and sea and salt marsh regeneration is something that is of great interest to a number of organizations around Cornwall. And I'm just thinking, for example, of Falmouth Harbour that are looking at the regeneration and protection of seagrass in Flushing for, uh, as, as one thing. But what, what is it that in Cornwall, uh, the scientific community and the general public uh, need to be able to do? What, what can we do to, to push the agenda forward? Because clearly you've made a very, very strong case because these three uh, coastal habitats, if you like, uh, or these three uh, coastal projects are the biggest we've got when it comes to climate change mitigation after peat bogs and mangrove forests. So what do we need to do in Cornwall to drive this agenda forward, would you say? Uh, first and foremost, I will, I will say, um, and I found this when we first met Roger in the Eden Project, Cornwall and the community of people within Cornwall are extremely progressive. They're very can do and they're very proud of their county. Um, um, in terms of from an environmental standpoint, and that was refreshing to see. But I think the main point is, and the, this is a really big point, the biggest skill, the biggest skill by far a scientist can have is bridging the gap between the science and the general public, communication. And so 
I think what Cornwall can do, and I think Cornwall are doing this, and people are starting to look to Cornwall because of the projects and the exciting projects, as you say, in Falmouth Harbour with Vicky, Vicky Spooner, who I'm working with in actual fact, we're developing a project there with the seagrasses. So I'm really thankful for that project. It's super exciting. Um, and of course, looking at, as you say, the magic three, so salt marsh, seagrass and kelp forest. What we want to do is let Cornwall be a shining example of best place practice of restoration and protection. And so therefore, the rest of the UK can look to Cornwall to say, well, hang about, this is how to do restoration and protect your ecosystem. Well, who better look at Cornwall? Because there's no other county that I can think of that celebrates biodiversity. You've got a cathedral to biodiversity with the Eden Project itself, for example. And so, it's all of those things. So it's bridging the gap between the science and the general public, communication and working with stakeholders to people that don't really realise how important those key, those key ecosystems are. So it's all about communication. Lovely. Thank you. You mentioned the Eden Project there and you, you and I were both um, fortunate enough to, to meet Tim Smith, uh, who's the guiding, guiding force behind that. And one of the things that he said uh, was that without community support, everybody else has a back door. Um, so you've got to get the community on board. And in Cornwall, there's that great sense of being free spirited and independent thinking with the can do attitude. And in Cornwall, you don't railroad anybody into it, anything. You don't give them that fate accompli. You talk to them. There's that sense of democracy and community and then you get people on board so you're absolutely spot on here <laughs> oh, th thank you roger and that, that's what i found you know i completely found that and, and fell in love with it and fell in love with the people there it's just fantastic um and as you say it's about communication and as you rightly say as well roger if you don't have the stakeholders and community on side you don't have a project and tim smith's exactly right you don't have a project hence the help the kelp project We've been, we're four years into the project and the first three years of those four years, we didn't even get in the water. We were working with the communities, working with the stakeholders, getting them on side, getting their trust, making them understand and bridging the gap between the scientists and the ecologists and the conservationists and the, the end users of why it's important for those coastal ecosystems. Um, Mangroves, for example, I'm a mangrove ecologist and my PhD was on mangrove restoration and mangrove biodiversity. 250 million people are directly dependent upon mangroves. So it's super important that we address all of these issues, but we're doing it slowly but surely, but it's getting there. But as you say, it's all about communication. Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, Lily, we're coming back to you. You've got, and you, and you, if we hung on long enough, there'd be a question. Lily, would you like to ask your question? Welcome yep. back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think, I, I mean, what you just said answered a lot of my question regarding the public interest and how, how your experiences with, um, yeah, engaging people and how, uh, yeah. But I think you you answered it quite well just now. So. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. No problem. No problem. OK, well, I it's coming up to uh, quarter to nine. And um, what I'm going to do is just assuming there are no other questions, just a few reminders uh, of upcoming events. We've got the uh, walk and talk at the Flicker Donkey Sanctuary on Saturday, the 7th of May at 2 p.m. And not only is it an opportunity for a walk and talk, but it's a brilliant opportunity to meet some of the uh, uh, fantastic donkey uh, residents, including Sparkle and Tinsel, who I note were at uh, Truro Cathedral last Sunday uh, for, Palm, for Palm Sunday. They were the donkeys on duty. So that's brilliant. So again, details are all uh, on the uh, uh, Cornwall Science Community website. And our next talk is on Wednesday, the 18th of May, and that's the Kerno weather team. And they're presenting, is the weather changing in Cornwall? Implications and perspectives uh, from the Kerno weather team. And 
Final one just to mention, Saturday the 3rd of July, hopefully you've been inspired by Ian, but we have the AK Wildlife Cruise out of Falmouth Harbour and we are going out looking for all sorts of uh, cetaceans, so maybe a whale or a, a several species of dolphin, uh, but also Emily Stevenson of Beach Guardian is joining us and we're doing a microplastic trawl uh, as well. And if we get around as far as the Bosbeel and Durgan end, I'll be able to show you some, nat some naturalised seagrass growth there as well, because I found seagrass uh, there. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure for you to be, uh, for us to have you here, and an especially uh, warm welcome to Dr Ian Hendy for sharing his enthusiasm and his research with you with you and with us. Ian, it's been an absolute pleasure. What a dynamo. Thank you very much. Uh, I completely enjoyed it. Completely thrilled and delighted. Thank you for inviting me, Roger and David. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thanks, all who's still on the call. As a cafe side tradition, I'll invite everybody to unmute themselves so we can give a round of applause to Ian as well for fielding questions so nicely and um, giving the talk. So thank you very much. Brilliant. I will do a round of applause. There you go. Oh.